Okay, in this video I'd like to continue on with my tutorial series discussing complex analysis. Specifically, this is video number 9 and we're going to discuss the Taylor and Lorentz series expansions. As usual, I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstutorials.com. Here I have all my videos archived and listed and I also have a few other bits and pieces which may be of interest to you. I'd like to recap on the videos previous to this which are relevant. Of course, we are discussing complex analysis and therefore my videos on complex numbers are relevant. In the section on complex analysis, I derived the Cauchy-Riemann equations, derived Green's theorem, derived the divergence theorem. I show the relationship between Green's theorem and the divergence theorem. In video 6, I discussed the Cauchy integral theorem and later the differential arc length formula. Video number 8, I derived the Cauchy integral formula. This particular formula and this particular video are the most important parts of the prerequisites for the current video number 9. I'd like to do some revision or motivation. A geometric series is one where a constant ratio exists between all the terms. Consider for example one half plus one quarter plus one eighth plus one sixteenth and so on. It can be shown that this is in fact the series from n is equal to one to infinity of one half to the n. Now let's build upon this a small bit. Consider the expression one over one minus x. It can be shown that this has a power series representation and that the power series representation is the infinite sum from zero to infinity of x to the n with a radius of convergence of the magnitude of x less than one. If you're not convinced of this, you can look at the division on the rest of the screen. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go through that though. The point really is that the function one over one minus x can be represented by an infinite power series. Now, while this might be something which you're familiar with already, this is, uh, in my opinion, quite an important property, and it was quite a big deal when it was first discussed, discovered that this is possible. So we're going to build upon this and discuss the Taylor and Lorentz series. So looking at the function 1 over 1 minus x, the condition that the magnitude of x must be less than 1 is important, because otherwise we won't get convergence and in actual fact it will not have a power series representation. So it only really works for small values of x. Unfortunately, such conditions are quite limiting, so we seek a more general expression. We make some assumptions about our function. First of all, we assume that f of x has a power series representation around x is equal to a. We assume that it is infinitely differentiable, and we assume that all of the derivatives exist. Basically, this boils down to us assuming that we're talking about an analytic or holomorphic function. Holomorphic is a more modern term for the word analytic. Basically, if your function satisfies these, it is analytic. A function which wouldn't be analytic is one which has a divide by zero scenario, or an infinity. Those are not analytic functions. So let's look at the power series of the following manner, where we take from n is equal to zero to infinity of a coefficient, let's say a sub n, and x minus a to the n, a being some constant, usually used to shift the function along the axis. So of course, this is pretty straightforward, a zero plus a sub one, x minus a to the one, and so on. We can represent this particular power series by what's known as a Taylor series when it satisfies the conditions mentioned above, basically when the function is analytic. In doing so, we get the Taylor series, which is outlined here. That's not something I want to get bogged down in. If you want, you can view my video number 13 in the section on thermodynamics. Remember, with an analytic function, it has a power series representation at the point x is equal to x0, or x is equal to a, whatever it is, and it's in powers of x minus x0. 
If it's differentiable at all points in the domain d, we refer to the function as being analytic. If it is differentiable only at, uh, excuse me, if it's differential at point x is equal to x0, we say that it is analytic at the point x is equal to x0. A function is referred to as singular when z or x is equal to x0 or z is equal to z0, where f of z or f of x is not analytic, it's not differentiable, or can even be defined at z is equal to z0. But in the neighborhood of z0, there it contains points which are analytic. So basically we may have a singular point at a particular, uh, a particular value for z, but in the neighborhood around it, the function is analytic. Analytic functions have Taylor or Maclaurin series expansions around x is equal to a. The difference between a Taylor and Maclaurin series is that for the Maclaurin series, a is equal to zero. Note that a divide by zero scenario or an infinity means that the function is not analytic. At the risk of boring you, let's try some repetition. Where we have a function f of x, which can be represented by an infinite power series and is infinitely differentiable and the derivative, derivatives exist, then we can define a Taylor series. See the thermodynamics video number 13. Analytic functions of Taylor series expansions at x is equal to a or z is equal to z0 or whatever it is you prefer. Taylor series can work for functions of a complex variable z such that z is equal to x plus i times y. In the following minutes, I present two ways of viewing the Lorentz series. Before doing so, we need to look at the Taylor series. First of all, in the manner I discussed in thermodynamics video number 13, and then through using the Cauchy integral formula, because that leads us to the Lorentz series expansion. So, in the previous video, number 13, in thermodynamics, I did the following approach. All continuous functions may be expanded in, as an infinite power series in the following manner. Let's examine the infinite derivatives of f of x centered at x is equal to x0. So let's take, let's say, t start taking the derivatives of this function up here and see what happens. The first derivative is going to be a sub 1. That's because this term here is going to go to 0 and all the other terms will be zero because they will still have an x minus x zero component which will go to zero when we let the function go to x zero. Similarly, if we take the second derivative, we'll be left over with a sub two multiplied by a coefficient. This seg seg segment here will be gone, but all the other expressions in the power series will have an x minus x zero term which will go to zero. The point here is if we take the first derivative, we get the well, second coefficient. If we take the second derivative, we get the third coefficient. If we take the third derivative, we get the fourth coefficient. Of course, the first coefficient is a sub zero, and you get that by having the zeroth derivative, if you want to think about it that way. It seems that if we take the nth derivative of our function and evaluate it at x is equal to x zero, it's equal to n factorial multiplied by the coefficient itself. We of course may rearrange this to calculate the coefficient a sub n, which is 1 over n factorial and the nth derivative of your function evaluated at x0. This allows us to rewrite the power series as the Taylor series expansion, which is written towards the bottom of your screen. Note by the way, this only works for analytic functions, functions which are infinitely differentiable, differentiable they don't have uh, zeros and they don't have poles. That was pretty straightforward. However, it doesn't help us in deriving the Lorentz series. So I'm going to tackle this again using the Cauchy integral formula. But there's a more elegant and useful method for doing this involving the Cauchy integral formula, which I've written at the top of your screen. Note, by the way, we're integrating the function capital F of Z, which is not analytic, but we rewrite it as the ratio of the analytic function small f of Z and Z minus A, where A is the pole. The result is the value of small f evaluated at A 
multiply by twice pi i. And we refer to this f of a as the residue, something I'll discuss in the next video. Now, whether I use the placeholder a or z0 for the pole is irrelevant. In this particular expression, I use a, but for the remainder of the video, I'm going to use z0. Here, I have rearranged the Cauchy integral formula to calc for, the, for the residue, so we have f of z0, so 1 over twice pi i, the anti-clockwise closed contour integral of small f of z dz over z minus z0. To be explicit, I've shown the fact that we're really integrating the function capital F of z, which is not analytic. Note, by the way, what you get out is a function of, what's, what, what, is, of what is here. So z0 and z0. Now I'm going to introduce two dummy variables. z is going to go to z prime. z0 is going to go to z the graphical interpretation of which you'll see in a moment. Now, it's for this reason that I've also placed these, uh, I have placed the small pink arrows. It's just to make you clear as to where the primes are and where they aren't. So the new variable of integration is dz prime. And we're going to integrate down from z prime to z, and that as a result is going to give us out f of z. Truth be told, we want f of z. We don't want f of z prime. But we're using this dummy variable f, or excuse me, z prime, in order to get at f of z, and later to actually get at the pole z0. Why do we do it? z lies inside the circle C. C is a circle of radius r, centered at the pole at z0. We let z prime be a variable at the surface of C. So previously we would have done something like we would have set up our circle C, maybe like this red line, and I might call it C prime, and we would have applied the Cauchy integral formula along that. You'll see in a moment why we don't do it, but rather we consider the circle c and use the variable z prime on that. It will allow us, as we shrink shrink down towards z, towards z, it will allow us to get actually at z0. Remember the Cauchy integral formula is only valid in the limit. Finally, look at the denominator. The denominator is 1 over z prime minus z. This is important. We try to expand 1 over z prime minus z in powers of z minus z0, not z prime. We do this because z prime is outside of z. Therefore, if we look at z prime minus z0 divided by z prime, excuse me, z minus z0 divided by z minus z0, its magnitude will be less than 1, and such a power series will converge. You can look at the diagram on the top in order to convince yourself that this is the case. So the reason we expand like this is because doing so will allow for convergence. We will see later in the video that when we do a similar process for the Laurent series, we expand not in z minus z0, but in z prime minus z0. And the reason is that it's we have to essentially swap the terms here in order to get convergence. How do we go about doing this particular power series expansion? Well, the first thing we're going to do is a standard but important algebraic manipulation. Let's take, let's take two variables a minus b. We have 1 over a minus b. We introduce another variable c by adding and subtracting, and rearrange so that we have a minus c outside of 1 over, excuse me, outside of 1 minus b minus c over a minus c. Plugging in our variables, we started with z prime minus z. For c, we use z0, and we rearrange. We saw at the start of the video 
that 1 over 1 minus x can be expressed as an infinite power series. We're going to do something similar with this, however I'm not going to prove it. The unproven formula I'm going to use is the finite ge ge geometric sum. You can see this particular Wikipedia link if you'd like to know more. So the geometric sum using the variable q and the power m is, re is written as follows, or not, not the power, excuse me, the indice m is written as follows. We can rearrange that to get what's written at the bottom of your screen. And it's this expression which we're going to use. Note, by the way, we, we have a 1 over 1 minus x sort of thing here and here. So we've seen how 1 over 1 minus x can be written as a power series. So I'm sure you can accept, without even looking at the Wikipedia link, that this finite geometric sum, in fact, works. Let's compare to what we have. We have a 1 over z prime minus z. So what we're going to do is we, we rearrange it as we did a moment ago. We have z prime minus z zero outside of this here. And in doing so, what we have is this one over one minus q sort of term here. One over one minus q, where q is defined as it is at the left hand side of your screen. I'll let you digest that for a moment. This means we can power series expand this particular expression here. In actual fact, let me be more specific. We power series expand this expression using this power series. The result, with a small bit of manipulation, is that at the bottom of your screen. Note, by the way, I've grouped all the terms going up to n, but left the n plus one term on its own. We'll see why in a moment. The really important point to note here, by the way, is we're after getting z, minus, z prime minus z zero on the denominator, whereas in the past we had z prime minus z. So it seems that in the limit, we're able to shrink z prime the whole way down to z zero and let's just look at what, what's happening at the pole itself. But let's not lose sight of the purpose. We're actually trying to evaluate this particular integral here. What we did was we power series expanded one over z prime minus z. So if you plug that back in, you'll get the expression at the bottom of your screen. I've called the n plus one term, by the way, the remainder. This will go to zero, but I'm not gonna discuss why. I don't think it's necessary for the present treatment. So using our power series expansion, we are able to rewrite our f of z no, by the way, it's f of z, not f of z prime. And we have z prime minus z zero here. So we're getting at f of z and the pole by using this dummy variable. But we're able to use the generalized Cauchy integral formula in order to calculate all of the, all of the, uh, the terms. That's something I don't need to get bogged down in right now. Using the generalized Cauchy integral formula, we we're able to go from this to what's written at the bottom of your screen. Just in case you're not convinced, just look at the similarity between what's here and what's here. And if you look closely, you have our Taylor series. So that's how we derive the Taylor series expansion using the Cauchy integral formula. You might be thinking that's much ado about nothing. We already derived it very quickly in the past, but I think we need to do what I've just done in order to get at the Lorentz series properly, which we do now. We must be able to distinguish between Taylor and Lorentz series. It's important to note that small f of z is, is analytic in the region of radius r from the pole z equals z zero. f of z, small f of z, does not in fact have singularities. For example, it divided by zero. But small f of z may have zeros, which might be, for example, zero over something which is non-zero. At a zero, of course, the derivatives don't exist. Now, I present something here which I don't want to get bogged down in. Think about taking the nth order derivative of course, 
if the nth order derivative is zero, then we know all previous derivatives are zero. This means that a sub n is non-zero, but all the ones up to that are. Therefore our Taylor series will become what's written at the bottom of your screen. I don't really want to get bogged down into this. This is just a small piece of mathematics which we can accept and use later on. So we would like to extend the concept of Taylor series to complex functions which are not necessarily analytic around the pole. Remember the Taylor series went right the whole way down to the pole. It worked. We seek a power series expansion for small f of z about the poles z sub n. We refer to such power series as the Lorentz series and they're useful where the singularities are known. Let's look at the similarity between a Taylor and Lorentz series. For the Taylor series expansion we are able to ex we are able to expand in powers of n going from 0 to infinity. With the Lorentz series we actually extend that to negative infinity around the point z is equal to z0. Now I yeah like the the fact that we have a pole here in the Taylor series is something we don't need to get bogged down in yet. The point is that it's analytic the function is analytic at a, at a radius in the neighborhood of the uh, of any particular point z0 but with the lorentz series the z it might not be analytic note of course with the lorentz series half of it of course is the taylor series and the rest is new we know that for analytic functions we get the positive a sub n's this means for our lorentz series an analytic function has a sub n equal to zero for all n less than zero. In other words, the Lorentz series is the generalized version of the Taylor series, such that when your function is analytic, all the a sub n's less than zero go to zero. We can express the coefficients as a sub n going from negative to positive infinity, or using a sub n for n greater than zero and b sub n for n less than zero as I've done here. Two different ways of writing it, using a single a sub n and extending from negative to positive infinity or using b sub n. Which you use is entirely up to you. Why is this useful you might be wondering. Don't worry it's something we're going to address very shortly. How do Lorentz series work? Well Taylor series are used for functions which are analytic in a circular region surrounding the singularity. Lorentz series are for functions that are analytic in an annular region between two concentric circles. Oh, that's a bit it's a bit hairy. So look just look at our domain. Our domain is in blue, it's D. We have our pole Z0. We also have two paths, C2 in pink and C1 in green. That makes an annular annular region annular region is here. Kind of like a donut. So the point is that with the Taylor series we could bring the path right the whole way down to here and we would have had our derivatives exist the whole way a whole way through and because the function is analytic at z0. However for the Taylor excuse me for the Lorentz series it's not analytic at z0. So instead what we do is we consider an inner contour and an outer contour and we look at the behavior between them. We let z be any point in the annulus between c1 and c2. Note that c1 is the inner contour and we invoke the Cauchy integral formula twice and follow a similar procedure to that used for the Taylor series derivation. With the Taylor series derivation we only had one contour and we let that shrink down to z0. Now we're going to have two contours and we're going to look at the difference between them because that's what's going to give us this annular region in here. So, we have f of z, not f of z0. Just like we did with the Taylor series. Now we're going to subtract from the integral involving the contour 2, the integral involving contour 1. Note by the way, I've called this integral 1 this integral too. So just be careful of the indices, even though I'm sure it's not it's something you're not going to get bogged down in. 
But Integral 1 has been solved previously. That's simply a Taylor series expansion. We know the answer. We know the coefficients. They're given by the generalized Cauchy integral formula written at the bottom of your screen. We apply the principle of deformation of path and let C2 go to C, which we can do because of the singular because the singularity at Z0 does not appear in C. Therefore, we have an uh, equation for a sub n in the Lorentz series. What does this really mean? Well, if we look at the contour C2 on the outside in pink, and we look at the contour in green on the inside. While these are two contours we're using in order to get at the real contour, which is the black one in C. So what we're doing is we evaluated the integral involving the contour C2. By deformation of path, we can easily shrink this down and let that become the integral C, or the integral involving the contour C. And that means they're going to be the same thing. We just found that the integral involving the contour C sub 2 is in actual fact a Taylor series expansion. So what we're after finding are the a sub n's for the, uh, the Lorentz series for the contour C. Remember that we had in their Lorentz series we have the a sub n's for the positive, the positive n values and the b sub n's for the negative n values depending on how you write it. We just found, in actual fact, this particular integral here is a Taylor series. What we have left to evaluate is this one here, which is integral C sub 1, the inner integral that was in green. In integral 1, the curve C, which is in black, lay inside C sub 2, and as a result we had a Taylor series. However, in integral 2, which is involving the green contour C1, the black contour C is outside of C1. Therefore, we have to adjust our approach because our, cur our curve included Z. Because when we had our curve which included Z, we had the following rad radius of convergence, which allowed us to power series expand in Z minus Z0. Now, as I previously said, we have to swap the two of these in order to get our power series to converge which means we're going to expand in powers of z prime rather than z. Here is the integral we are looking to solve. In the past when we discussed the Taylor series we had 1 over z prime minus z was equal to this here. We still have 1 over z prime minus z but we actually have to expand using a different power series and if we swap the if we swap it around we can see we can we can get it in this particular form here and as a result we're going to be able to expand in powers of z prime minus z zero we follow the exact same approach as we did with the taylor series we remember the formula one over one minus q which when applied gives us this particular expression for 1 over z prime minus z. Note once again I've grouped all the terms up to n and left the n plus 1 term out and so on. I don't really want to dwell on the, the algebra. So we have our expression. The integral here using the power series expansion and plugging back in the integrals can be written in a very similar fashion as we did with the Taylor series, and we have a remainder again. Once again, I won't explain why, but the remainder goes to zero as we let n go to infinity. In doing so, we get our b sub n's. Now the difference between this and what we had in the past is as follows. When we em employ the generalized Cauchy integral theorem, now we're going to have one over z minus z zero in the denominator. If I very quickly pop back to our Taylor series, we see that, excuse me, we see that these, my apologies for that. We see if we look back at the Taylor series, which is here, the z prime minus z zero terms, in actual fact, when we utilize the generalized Cauchy integral formula, they are in the numerator. 
So when we invoked the generalized Cauchy integral formula, which is at the bottom of your screen on the right, we got the Taylor series where we had the z minus z0 terms in the numerator. This time, however, this is back to the Lorentz series. This time, however, when we do it, we're going to find that these terms are in actual fact in the denominator. So we can say that the integral i sub 2, which corresponds to the b sub m's, can be written in the following power series format, where we go from m is equal to 0 to infinity of b sub m divided by z minus z0 to m. If you want, you can compare and contrast your b sub m's and your a sub m's. This can all be written compactly if we use a single indice n which goes from negative to positive infinity in the following fashion. This is the Lorentz series expansion for a function which is not analytic in the region around the pole. So instead of integrating right down to the pole, we in fact have to use an analysis, and that's how we get at it. So, thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my YouTube channel, and you might also check out universityphysicstutorials.com. Thank you.